Hello, and thank you very much to the National Scleroderma Foundation for the invitation to speak on preventative care for scleroderma. This topic is important because it's aimed to teach you how to self-advocate for yourself in order to stay well. My name is Tracy Freck, and I'm at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. So the goal of our talk today is to cover preventative care, and this will include cardiovascular risk reduction, bone health, age-appropriate cancer screening, immunization timing, and scleroderma-specific screening guidelines. But I think it's important when we're starting a talk on scleroderma to realize why patients with scleroderma really need to know about preventative care. I like to start by explaining why scleroderma is so different amongst different patients. And this is classically because we just define the disease scleroderma by where there is skin fibrosis or thickening. And so when we talk about scleroderma as a disease, we usually start by breaking it into two separate categories. The first is localized scleroderma, and this is um, skin-only scleroderma, meaning there's no internal organ involvement. And this generally um, is also termed morphia, which are plaques of thick skin, or linear lesions, which can be called linear scleroderma. And localized scleroderma is managed um, with dermatologists to help uh, guide care recommendations. Systemic scleroderma or systemic sclerosis is then broken down usually to where your physician palpates thickened skin. And if it's limited below the elbows or below the knees and there's no abdominal involvement, that's termed limited systemic sclerosis. And if there's diffuse involvement, meaning upper arms, belly or thigh involvement, that's called diffuse systemic sclerosis. And then if there's systemic features without any skin involvement, that's called scleroderma sine scleroderma. And by trying to break scleroderma into these different categories, that can be particularly difficult because patients can change characteristics over time, meaning limited patients can become diffuse or diffuse patients can become limited. And then systemic sclerosis without any skin involvement can have some atypical skin features. And so one of the th important things is rather than thinking of scleroderma as where is my skin thickening, thinking through this is why is it important to know what type of scleroderma I have and how can I best move forward with my care? And so um, systemic scleroderma is thought to be different than localized scleroderma, and that it ha has a blood test called an ANA with a scleroderma-specific autoantibody. And what's important when you're trying to figure out what type of scleroderma you have and what care recommendations um, apply to you is understanding both where your skin involvement is at that point in time when you're being examined and what is your scleroderma-specific autoantibody. And this is usually only tested once and not repeated multiple times. So you can get a pretty good understanding of what type of scleroderma you have. And that's blood tests with the autoantibodies is why systemic sclerosis is referred to rheumatology. Like we talked about, that localized form of disease um, oftentimes is treated by dermatology, but the rheumatologist is going to examine you and think through what systemic features you have and how do we best treat you. So usually that first step of answering that question is determined by how long you've had disease. So we talked about the importance of that skin exam to determine whether you have diffuse skin involvement or limited skin involvement. And usually breaking it into skin categories was important because it told us really what to expect over time and how we would properly monitor. You can see that in both limited and diffuse disease, most disease activity is occurring in those first five years. Now the classification criteria for systemic sclerosis give points to different clinical features. And if someone has nine points without a mimic of scleroderma or another cause that um, changes uh, hard skin, then we say with certain sensitivity and specificity that we think the diagnosis is properly scleroderma. But I like to show these classification criteria differently because it really highlights the importance of understanding vascular damage in systemic sclerosis. And so when we talk about systemic sclerosis, we usually will use the first, the, the term systemic sclerosis is an autoimmune disease characterized by progressive vascular change or vasculopathy with resultant fibrosis. And when we look for different features of disease, we're trying to understand where is the vascular findings um, and, and on the body and how aggressive is the fibrosis that's occurring. And the reason we try to think through this spectrum of immune dysfunction, vascular dysfunction, and fibrosis is we believe this to be 
a small vessel vasculopathy that results in changes in the immune system and that causes um, fibrosis or scarring. And when we look at the hands, we see the spectrum of Raynaud's phenomenon then puffiness and then fibrotic changes. And obviously our goal for treatment is to interrupt this disease progression to keep uh, patients well. A treatment approach then to systemic sclerosis must account for that disease duration and what internal organs are involved. But most importantly, we wanna prevent possible damage. So let's talk about what is preventative care. Diagnostic care is related to services in which your provider is looking for something specific. And this is often based on results of a preventative or screening test. And I'll give you the example, if you had screening pulmonary function tests and those were abnormal, your doctor may order a high resolution CT to make the diagnosis of interstitial lung disease. Preventative care, however, is different than that diagnostic care, and it helps detect that serious or preventable injury before they become major. So this is such as a screening colonoscopy wants to find a colon polyp before it becomes cancerous. Prevention is generalizable. So whether you have limited skin involvement or diffuse skin involvement, whether you have a positive ANA or thermospecific autoantibodies, prevention is, is applies to everyone, even if, to the caregivers in the audience. Diagnostic care however, is different. That is patient specific. That's where your data is looked at and diagnosis is made. So I think prevention is an important topic. So let's talk about prevention. And so usually prevention and screening is used interchangeably. And what I like to point out in this slide is that prevention starts even at age 18. And so at that point, we recommend that um, any patient without who's healthy or without any disease has a blood pressure check. And the blood pressure check becomes important at any age if you have a diagnosis of systemic sclerosis, because again, we wanna understand the vascular progression of this disease. I like this slide because it shows as we age, there becomes more and more screening tests that become important. And in particularly, if we have a patient on immunosuppression, so a drug that suppresses the immune system, we like to ensure that uh, that age appropriate cancer screening is up to speed. And this does change with age, as well as if you're suppressing your immune system, if you're at risk for infectious diseases, that these have been screened for. Because again, the idea of prevention is we screen before there's a problem. So if we're gonna suppress the immune system and the immune system is supposed to patrol the body for, body for infection and cancers, we wanna catch those before we start that medication. So let's talk about cardiovascular risk reduction as our first preventative care feature. And I like to, to point out that um, when we looked at skin biopsies in a, in a methodology that was standardized, we looked at healthy controls compared to early systemic sclerosis and late systemic sclerosis. And so these skin biopsies were analyzed for features that distinguished them. And what we found is that in early systemic sclerosis, we saw a lot of edema or swelling, particularly around the blood vessels. And in late systemic sclerosis, we saw fibrosis or scarring around vessels and vessel dropout. And so what we believe this to mean is that as scleroderma progresses, we see a loss of vascular health. And so the first thing you would ask, well, how could we improve vascular health so that we don't have a loss of vessels or scarring? And so to better understand that, we did lots of different experiments looking at um, uh, cuff occlusion and how the blood flow rebounds, single limb exercises. We tried different pharmaceutical interventions and passive limb movement to try to understand what makes scleroderma blood vessels different and how can we improve their function? And one of the things we found was that exercise really helped keep that circulation healthy. So if we want to make sure that we're keeping blood vessels functioning, we not only need to exercise, but we also need to eat healthy. Our blood vessel health it is dependent on um, adequate nutrition as well as appropriate uh, cholesterol profiles. We also want to optimize our blood sugar. So knowing that you are not diabetic is important and that you've been screened for diabetes can, is important for cardiovascular risk reduction. Patients should track their blood pressure. We know that blood pressure that runs at goal has blood vessel um, function that is normal or, or um, closer to healthy controls. 
Our patients that did not smoke had much healthier um, blood vessel function. And we um, noticed that um, the importance of intervening with stress management so that blood pressure effects um, ran lower. And uh, when we looked at this in a systematic method, we found that each of these um, methodologies to keep circulation healthy translated into better blood flow me measurements on each of these um, measurement tools that we used. So physical activity or exercise can be something that's really challenging for some people, and it's because you're busy. So a lot of people don't enjoy uh, exercise, so it's something that you have to work into your regimen. And so ideally, we say 150 minutes each week is what we should try to strive for. And one of the ways that you can get there is a 10-minute brisk, uh, brisk walk three times a day, five days a week. And one way you can do this is, is trying to park 10 minutes from where you work and trying to walk there uh, as quick as you can to work and back to your car. And then at your lunch break, if you can try to do um, a 10 minute brisk walk, you are able to achieve this. And that doesn't require extra time in your day. It requires just a shifting of what you're doing during um, your, your work week. I also like to point out that what exercise is, is just getting your heart rate up. So rather than trying to join a gym and, and trying to force yourself to go there, anything that gets you moving counts. So walking, dancing, working in the yard, as long as you're active and you're getting your heart rate up works. An important way to kind of motivate yourself to do this, you're encouraged to keep a blood pressure log. You can also notate on that log how many days a week you're exercising. And the reason that's really important is once you start to write it down, you can realize how, um, how little you're doing. And if you're not um, keeping a log, you may be inclined to just do once or twice a week. So it can help you motivate yourself to, to do it more often. If you're not in the habit of exercising, you know, getting motivated is really half the battle. So finding your friend to commit to a program with, and that could be great use of your friends or contacts at the Scleroderma Foundation, making an appointment to work together towards an exercise goal is a great way to have fun, but also meet your cardiovascular risk reduction goals. Be specific when you're talking to your friend. What activity do you want to do? How long should it be? How often are you going to do this? When's the best time of day? Some people love to exercise first thing in the morning, other people more in the afternoon. Whatever you decide, keep your goal realistic and don't try to change too much at once. Don't say, you know, my goal is to run a marathon. Instead, your goal is to run a mile. So just set reasonable goals and um, reward yourself um, when you, you achieve them. Now, healthy diet is also kind of a difficult a concept in systemic sclerosis um, because diet is such a sensitive topic. GI tracts in systemic sclerosis can be very different. And depending on where you are with the disease duration, there are certain foods you may or may not tolerate. But we do know that a healthy diet can reduce the risks of heart disease, diabetes, osteoporosis, and some cancers. So from a preventative screening standpoint um, or strategy, this is a really important concept. You should balance your calories with physical activity to manage your weight. So if you're underweight and you're starting to increase your activity, you may need to increase supplements like Boost or something that can give you a little bit more calories. If you're overweight and you're trying to lose weight, same thing goes. I, I don't ever want you to target a weight to get to. The goal is to try to get you to do activity that you enjoy and eating a diet that's healthy and well-balanced. Taking, uh, uh, taking out the simple sugars and things that can cause weight gain but um, getting enough calories that you're burning with healthy um, alternatives. People say, well, what are, what's healthy? Um, fruits, vegetable, whole grains, and seafoods are considered healthy food types. Now, again, if you have a seafood allergy or you can't tolerate whole grains, there's some nuances here that um, are different for you. But green is good and fresh is best is generally concepts that's true for every patient and is important for cardiovascular risk reduction. Try to watch your salt, your saturated fats, trans fats, cholesterol, added sugars, and refined grains. And so really do track what you're eating alongside of the calories you're burning to try to understand how is your nutrition. And if you're worried about your nutrition and you do not feel like you're meeting your goals, have a very low threshold to talk to your provider about meeting with a dietitian so you can have good, a solid education. So cholesterol is a really important topic because um, cholesterol is important for our cell function. Um, it is 55% of the cell membrane, so we do need cholesterol, but it's tricky because there's bad cholesterol, good cholesterol, and then uh, triglycerides, which are made in, in the liver and come from certain foods. 
So the HDL under 40 is considered poor and a risk factor for heart disease in both men and women. And the one thing that we can do to increase our HDL is to, to exercise. And so if you have a low HDL, make sure that you are vigilant about reporting your um, uh, exercise regimen. The bad cholesterol is your LDL, and you also want to know where this number uh, runs because what your goal level is depends on how many cardiovascular disease risk factors you have. And so um, when you have a blood vessel that has some atherosclerosis, um, we know that there's a plaque that is contributing to reduced blood flow. Now, systemic sclerosis also reduces the blood flow. And so you're Goal ALD, LDL level is going to be determined if you have known vascular disease and, um, and uh, what your blood pressure runs. So those are kind of two important things to know uh, with your uh, treating physician. Triglycerides um, are... Um, difficult um, to, to read on some cholesterol screening tests because these are the ones that can be affected by fasting. So if you've had your cholesterol pale and you were not fasting, that high triglyceride level may be falsely elevated. But if you were truly fasting, a high triglyceride level with that low HDL or high LDL is associated with the most plaque formation. So it's important to, to talk to your doctor about medications that can treat the LDL and triglyceride level to, to ensure your blood vessels are functioning at their best possible um, level. And again, that HDL, if it's low, really increasing your exercise is important. Blood pressure monitoring is essential for any patient who carries a diagnosis of systemic sclerosis. And of course, that's because we're always worried or concerned about the risk of scleroderma renal crisis. And so scleroderma renal crisis is where you have very elevated blood pressure and your kidney function is not um, you have a reduction in your kidney function. So it's important for every scleroderma patient to own a home blood pressure cuff um, a device. The way you check your blood pressure is you empty your bladder or bowels and avoid caffeine or tobacco for at least 30 minutes before measurement. And this is usually done best first thing in the morning before you eat. You get up, you rest for three to five minutes, seat, um, you're, you, seat in a, you sit in a chair with a back um, support, and you keep your legs uncrossed with your feet flat on the ground. And you sit there, relax, let, relaxing breathing, trying to, to um, uh, think, uh, I always say happy thoughts like you're in Hawaii, and then you push the start button. And you should make sure that your arm is bare so that you don't do it over a thick sweater or a jacket and that your arm is at heart level at the middle of your sternum. If you have a large cuff or large arm, you, make, you need to make sure your device is equipped with a large adult cuff because if you have too small of a cuff, your, your blood pressure will be falsely elevated. And then wrist cuffs are really only appropriate if the, if the arm circumference is over 17 inches. Those otherwise can falsely um, have, give false measurements of blood pressure. No one should talk to you during your, your um, blood pressure measurement. And then after it's recorded, then you will write this down and bring that log to your physician visit. And you can consider carrying a renal crisis card. Um, I've writ uh, written the link here. And what that uh, card will do is it will allow you to um, alert a treating emergency room physician that you're being, you're being referred to the emergency department for elevated blood pressure and you need your kidney function checked, as well as some advanced screening, such as electric cardiogram. And that's important because if you're being treated in an emergency room who's um, and the physician or treating provider has never heard of scleroderma, they might um, just discharge you without paying adequate attention to a blood pressure elevation and, and documenting the labs in the, in the electrocardiogram. So let's shift a little bit to um, our next preventative um, item, which is low bone density. Low bone density is something that um, I think is an incredibly important preventative topic, but unfortunately, we oftentimes wait until it's too late and a DEXA scan has shown osteopenia or osteoporosis. So the best thing we have for low bone density prevention is physical activity. So like muscles, your bones become stronger and stay stronger with regular exercise. So in addition to cardiovascular strengthening, um, it'll help us with our bone strength. Body weight plays in, ha, has an impact on low bone density. So being too thin will make you more likely to get osteoporosis. And as we know that um, oftentimes in systemic sclerosis, when the gut is involved, our weight will run low. And so um, again, important that we're thinking about screening for bone density, particularly if you've lost um, a lot of weight or you run a body mass index that's below normal. 
Smoking is, is not good for your bone health for two reasons. The first is it can um, keep your body from using the calcium in the diet. And then women who smoke go through menopause earlier, which puts their bone health at risk. So discontinuing smoking is good for many reasons, but has a very important preventative measure, both for cardiovascular health, as well as bone health. Alcohol is another important thing to limit. People who drink a lot are more likely to get osteoporosis. And so particularly if you're at high risk because of low body weight um, or a family history of fracture, those are patients who should really um, make sure they're limiting alcohol intake and then make sure you review your medications with your provider uh, to ensure you're on the minimal amount of medications that can affect your bone health. And that can include steroids and blood thinners. And I have a nice link to the NIH Bone uh, Health National Resource Center that provides a lot of the information on each of these topics. But the key is to know how to dietarily approach bone health. And it's important to realize that both calcium and vitamin D levels recommendations change with age. But regardless of the recommendation, it's important that our dietary source of calcium is, is something that is um, is that is focused on and fits with your gastrointestinal tract. What I mean by that is you can't just take your whole supplement of calcium by dietary supplement, you split it in half and get that other half through a dietary source. And this is, this is something important to track and make sure you're getting adequate um, calcium intake, uh, again, because of its prevention for bone health. And then vitamin D should be supplemented to the appropriate level you should request a vitamin D level from your healthcare provider. And this is generally done annually and making to make sure that your vitamin D level runs at goal and that you're on a supplementation, um, an adequate supplementation. Some people require quite high doses to get their vitamin D level at the adequate goal. Screening for low bone density involves a DEXA scan, and usually this starts at age 65 for women that are not, are healthy women that are not particularly at risk for osteoporosis. And so generally you'll have your screen at 65 and then every two to five years, depending on risk factors repeated. This really changes when you have more risk factors for a low bone density. And there's a tool you can use to look at your risk for bone density. And this can include um, a fracture from a minor trauma. So if you fell on outstretched hand and you developed a fracture, that would be considered um, a minor trauma. If you have um, inflammatory arthritis, and so systemic sclerosis can have inflammatory arthritis. And the reason this is in rheumatoid arthritis is, as opposed to all of our inflammatory conditions is, is this our most common autoimmune disease. So when you look at large databases, this is 1% of the population. That's cl a clear signal that this is a risk factor for um, low bone density. And that's thought to be because of the medications and or chronic inflammation. And so very reasonable for folks younger than 65 that have had a lot of inflammatory joint disease to talk to their provider about a DEXA scan. Again, we talked about if you have a low body weight, very reasonable discussion to have an earlier DEXA scan, a parent who had a hip fracture, excessive drinking tobacco use, or corticosteroids, that's prednisone, for a long period of time. All reasons to talk to your provider about getting that DEXA scan so that you can plug in the numbers and see your risk for um, osteoporosis or osteopenia. And the, the reason that number is so important um, is because we have therapies that we can offer. Now, these are mostly, um, or sorry, these are FDA approved for age 50 and older. And the reason for that is that's where the drugs have been studied and used. Um, but um, the, the important thing to realize is that if you do have osteoporosis and you're younger than 50 and you're um, not uh, planning to, to get pregnant and not breastfeeding, these medications may be something that you choose to start sooner. Um, in, in particular, it's important that um, you know, talking with your uh, clinician about the risks of your DEXA scan results and your patient and your preferences that um, it may be uh, ind indicated that these medications are used for a certain period of time and then stopped and the studies repeated. And I really strongly believe that um, bone density or bone uh, clinics that focus on bone health are an incredible resource uh, for patients because you can have an individualized approach to understanding the different therapeutics that you um, may benefit from. And again, uh, these medications uh, may be contraindicated if you have an esophageal stricture or um, if you have other features in your disease. So an important patient preference question is, is to be educated on your options and make an educated decision on whether these medications are right for you. 
Let's now shift to age-appropriate cancer screening. Um, cancer screening is very confusing because there's lots of different societal guidelines out there, and you can find lots of different um, recommendations from different um, providers. To, what I'm showing is the American Cancer Society guidelines, and I just really want to highlight um, the information that I think is important for each patient to take away. The first that I'll start on is a skin check annually by dermatology. I think it's important if you're on any immunosuppression. Remember, our, our immune system is patrolling our bodies for cancers. And um, with a lot of sun exposure, we can have skin cancers. So seeing, being seen by a dermatologist so they can inspect um, different moles or lesions for uh, asymmetry or dif uh, distinct colors that would require um, a biopsy would be uh, an important um, preventative aspect of care if you're on immunosuppression. For breast cancer screening at age 40, you talk to your doctor about when you want to begin screening. Um, if you have a family, a strong family history of breast cancer or um, um, want to talk to your physician about, uh, physician about earlier screening, those recommendations can, again, be personalized for you. Usually yearly mammograms start at age uh, 45, um, though, again, between 40 and 45, perfectly appropriate for you to check every year, is particular if you, particularly if you're on immunosuppression. At age 55, you can transition to every other year or, and here's the key, continue with annual mammography, depending on your preferences. So really your decision on how often you're screened really is important to take into account what you want to do and um, not let the provider tell you, oh, you now only have to do it every other year. If you're on immunosuppression and feel um, like you wanna have a mammogram every year, absolutely appropriate for you to do. Colorectal cancer, the guidelines have recently changed to age 45. It used to be at 50. Um, again, earlier can be done if you have a strong family history of colon cancer, or certainly if you have any symptomatology that you're worried about, um, that, that screening then becomes more diagnostic in that case, but you have access to a colonoscopy. At age 76 to 85, same thing as the frequency and types of screenings can be determined by conversation. And that is, again, important to take into account um, your quality of life and whether you um, want to continue um, with the invasive colonoscopy versus other options like stool cards. And then age 85, um, while it's technically the American Cancer Society says patients should no longer get colorectal screening cancer, if someone is incredibly healthy and active and wishes to continue, that is, um, again, a reasonable conversation to have with a provider. So the real take-home message for cancer screening is talk to your provider about what you feel the most comfortable with. With prostate screening, um, the key is if you have um, family history of prostate cancer um, and you're very high risk, you can start earlier screening and that, um, that, that regular screening at age 50 can then be uh, discussed annually uh, with your provider, whether that's the right choice for you. And then lastly, cervical um, cancer screening. It varies every three years if you've just had a pap smear and then every five years if your pap smear and human papillomavirus testing is done. And so really talking to your provider where you're at with your individual cancer screening um, is something that you should have a good handle on uh, whether you um, have been informed on what uh, is available and whether you feel comfortable with those care recommendations or whether you want to move from that screening process perhaps to a more diagnostic process with endoscopy. Immunization timing, and this is a hard slide to read because there's lots of data here, but I'm going to really hit the high points here. And the, the high point is that planned immunosuppression is the best time to get immunizations up to speed. And so knowing what your, what, what your immunization status is, is important when you go to your rheumatologist's office because you can get your um, immunizations um, up to, to date before you start that medication. There used to be a lot of debate on low versus high level immunosuppression. This is from 2014. And low level was thought to be certain um, uh, immunomodulators and, high, and uh, low dose steroids. And high level was um, higher dose steroids and, and uh, medications such as rituximab. And it was thought that this how we think through live viruses is particularly important because they're contraindicated with high level uh, immunosuppression. 
But in 2017, the zoster vaccine Shinrix became available or the preferred shingles vaccine, and that becomes less important in trying to make that distinguishing um, between low and high uh, immunosuppression, though when you pull the official guidelines, you'll still see that the, this varies. What your real take home message is, is are you planning to be on immunosuppression because that's the best timing for immunization. Now, the COVID brought up some important points, and this became um, the first time we started thinking about holding vaccines to allow the most robust immune response. And so like for flu shot and pneumonia shot, we tactically for many years never held your immunosuppression. We gave your, your immunosuppression. Um, and then if you presented for flu shot, we went ahead and give, gave that shot while you're taking your medications. Based on, on data that has moderate um, uh, amount of consensus, um, there are some important points and that um, medications can be held one to two weeks at, as disease activity allows um, after each COVID uh, dose. And what usually will happen is you'll talk to your doctor about what time you're gonna get your, your booster, you'll hold your immunosuppression, you'll um, uh, uh, then go uh, one to two weeks and then restart it. And this level of consensus is moderate for all with the exception of Plaquenil, which everyone felt very strong that you, you can continue your Plaquenil or IVIG with no modifications to your immunomodulary therapy or uh, uh, vaccination timing. So there's two medications we use each. It's just treating as usual and then otherwise holding that dose um, as feasible. Oh, I will point out this is, this is a good document summary and it's updated periodically by the American College of Rheumatology. So it's a good link to, to make sure that you have the latest and greatest data on the COVID vaccine recommendations. So we're going to just finish up with systemic versus screening recommendations. So screening means that there are no worrisome uh, symptoms, that the frequency of screening um, is going to be completely determined by your specific history, your physical exam, and your autoantibody. Like we talked about in the earlier um, slide, how long you've had disease is a really important concept of how often we're going to screen. We may screen a lot more frequent in that first five years diseases. We think there's more disease activity. And the two screens that we um, usually think in the screening category that every patient with systemic sclerosis should make sure that they've had is uh, pulmonary function tests, which screens for interstitial lung disease, and an echocardiogram, which screens for pulmonary arterial hypertension. So if you have a diagnosis of systemic sclerosis, you may get PFTs more frequently if you're early in disease, but everyone gets a PFT. And then the echocardiogram generally is done annually. And then additional screens that may be done if, based on your symptoms and or treatments, maybe an electrocardiogram, a six-minute walk test where, they, where you walk and it assess whether you need oxygen, and certain laboratory screens, such as a basic natriuretic peptide, which screens for cardiac involvement. So systemic cirrhosis history, we talked about talking, uh, we talked about your skin exam, determining whether you have diffuse or limited disease, and how long you've had the disease. But another important thing when we're talking talk about screening is what treatments are you on? Because that, if someone who's untreated may require more frequent screening to help determine if there's gonna be a treatment initiation. And so vasodilators are indicated for Raynaud's phenomenon, digital ulcers and pulmonary arterial hypertension. Immunosuppression is used for evolving skin. Um, that's a skin thickening, that's assessed on clinical exam. In interstitial lung disease, inflammatory arthritis, and muscle inflammation, which is termed myositis. And then antifibrotic disease, or, uh, drugs are used if there's evidence of interstitial lung disease. And so the treatments we have, again, are determined by how long you've had disease and what your screening shows. So the two screens that I'd like to highlight is that um, pulmonary function test, if there's evidence of restriction on spirometry, or if there's an isolated number of diffusion capacity that's that seen, what is important is to do a high resolution CT of the chest to make an interstitial lung disease diagnosis. So this is a screen that leads to a diagnosis. An abnormal echocardiogram is a screening on um, on echocardiogram where we, we measure the um, tricuspid regurg jet, we're looking for the right side of the heart being large, whether there's flattening of the interventricular septum, whether there's suggestion of a dilated pulmonary artery or a pericardial effusion, which means uh, fluid around the heart, 
all of that on an echocardiogram that would suggest elevated pulmonary pressures would require a right heart catheterization to make a diagnosis of pulmonary arterial hypertension. So your screen helps guide the next step for diagnosis. You cannot make a diagnosis alone of interstitial lung disease on pulmonary fun function tests. You cannot make a diagnosis of pulmonary arterial hypertension alone on an echocardiogram. If you have pulmonary arterial hypertension, you may be referred for additional things besides scleroderma that can cause pulmonary arterial hypertension, such as a sleep evaluation or a screen for blood clots based on other features in your history. So again, um, the importance of further diagnostics is determined by the results you have. Now, one of the challenges that occur um, is, is as a, um, a kind of a screening concept is that of the gastrointestinal tract. And this comes up quite a bit because when we think through scleroderma and we see this is a progressive small blood vessel change that causes the immune system to, to react um, in a way where the, there's puffiness and inflammation and that results in fibrosis. We can see that on the skin. We can monitor for these um, with our pulmonary and cardiac screens. How do we do this best in the gastrointestinal tract? And the problem is, is um, certain uh, findings such as gastrointestinal uh, uh, gastric antral vascular tasias or GAVE, biopsy um, diagnoses or manometry changes that are classic for scleroderma may be more indicative of sort of end stage or um, of disease damage as opposed to activity. So we always like to ask the question, how can we do the best um, uh, job at screening the GI tract? And the answer is listening to other patients. And if you have concerns about your symptoms, making sure you're referred to a gastroenterologist for a thoughtful uh, gastrointestinal tract screening approach. That really highlights the value of a team approach to preventative care. And so your rheumatologist is going to do your skin, muscle, and laboratory assessments, particularly when you're on immunosuppression. But I think I, I can't say enough good things about the importance of exercise. And this um, shown here is um, Dr. Uh, or is, uh, Rachel Lando, who is a um, important force in our scleroderma community, uh, who um, teaches patients on yoga and movement to try to get skin and muscles and joints moving better. And so uh, again, can't highlight enough the value of trying to learn about movement, yoga, getting good blood flow to your uh, skin and joints as being an ancillary approach to whatever medications you're prescribed. For pulmonary, in addition to your pulmonary function test, your echocardiogram, your six-minute walk, and oxygen assessments, you may be a candidate if you have interstitial lung disease for pulmonary rehabilitation. So rather than just seeing a pulmonologist, always ask if there's ancillary services to help getting you moving more effectively and getting um, your uh, uh, oxygenation to your tissues improved. With gastroenterology, in addition to the invasive procedures that we talked about being um, guided by your symptoms, gastroenterologists oftentimes work with dietitians in their office, so seeing if the dietitian can meet with you to discuss if your dietary and nutritional needs are being met can be an important uh, aspect of your care. And then lastly, um, well, if you have a digital ulcer, wound care can be important. If you're developing um, contractures, occupational therapy for dynasplints and additional uh, movement techniques, and social work to help you navigate um, your activities of daily living and, and what resources you have to get the full quality of life is an important aspect. So preventative care requires a team approach, both your traditional medical providers, but also ancillary services supporting them, so with the focus of you in the middle. The effect of preventative care is very impactful. It keeps our patients well and it improves outcomes. And uh, one of the, um, the important resources in the United States is the Collaborative National Quality and Efficacy Register, or CONQUER Registry, where centers are collecting um, standardized data on patients with five years disease duration and less of systemic sclerosis so that we can make sure that we understand this impact of prevention. So there's been a real shift to early diagnosis and when we're screening and giving therapeutic interventions, we're capturing therapies that are not non-traditional such as exercise um, and uh, movement so that we can prevent disease progression. And what a collaborative research program does is it coordinates your care so that we're taking the best possible care of you. And so here are some systemic sclerosis uh, centers here. We recently established ours at Nashville, uh, in Nashville. So in summary, 
Um, please know that advocating for yourself um, means you need to know what does cardiovascular risk reduction mean? So are you monitoring your blood pressure? Are you exercising regularly and recording it? And are you trying your best to eat a healthy diet? Green is good, fresh is best. Are you maximizing your bone health strategies and screening? So um, do you think you're at risk for osteoporosis and osteopenia? Should you be screened with a DEXA scan? And if your DEXA scan's abnormal, have you talked to a provider about what potential treatment options you have? Where does your calcium and vitamin D um, need to be? And are you taking supplements properly? You want to ensure that your age-appropriate cancer screening is up to date. And again, the, I, what I really wanted you to take home from that, that um, those slides from American Cancer Institute is it really highlights patient preference and how you're feeling and what symptoms you're having. And so um, if you're eligible for screening and you want to be screened, that's important that you get that screening done. Um, let, you should be telling your physician what you're most comfortable with, uh, not the other way around. You want to time your vaccinations properly around immunosuppression, and that's ideally before you start. And make sure you understand what your PFT and your echocardiogram screening results show. So I, you know, they're just numbers, but what you can do is keep them in your scleroderma folder, bring them to your uh, appointment, keep them with you, and you can, and your physician can talk through the number changes or if you require um, diagnostics such as the high-res CT of the chest or the right heart catheterization. And screening becomes diagnostic, particularly if you're having symptoms. So even if you've had your screening studies and you're symptomatic, that becomes um, a shift in the conversation to more diagnostic care. You want to know who's on your healthcare team and what interventions they offer. Make sure you advocate for yourself if you would benefit from a dietitian or pulmonary rehabilitation or a formal exercise program. Those are um, conversations you should feel comfortable having with your provider. And then lastly, consider participating in research for preventative care because it helps us move the field forward and less of a focus on, on prescription medications and more um, empowerment with um, movement and exercise, which can improve um, vasculopathy. With that, I'd like to acknowledge, uh, most importantly, scleroderma patients and their caregivers who have made uh, my career um, so fulfilling, uh, my funding sources, um, the different researchers I've worked with that have helped uh, make a discovery and advancement in the field of scleroderma. And with that, we'll uh, shift to, to questions and discussion.